Hello, in this presentation I'm going to be talk about relative age dating and how we've used that to determine um, the geologic time period. So in this image, what we're looking at is the Grand Canyon. This is an oblique aerial photograph and we're looking down the Grand Canyon. And this is a classic place where we like to go and start to think about um, how rocks are formed and kind of the timing of things. So things that you should see in this image are the layers of the rocks all through here. We can see the Colorado River cutting down below it. And so we start to wonder, you know, what's going on? You know, why is it that when we look right here, we see really steep rocks and right here, why is it gradual? And then as we go out into these areas, we can start to go and actually look at the rocks and learn more about them. Um, so actually what we're seeing here are differences in weathering because of different rock types. So the steep rocks are more resistant to weathering. Where we see the slopes, this is where it's been weathered much more easily. Um, and then we can see that the Colorado River is actively eroding down at the bottom of the channel. The first geologist who ever came to look at the Grand Canyon was John Wesley Powell. And as he looked at this whole area, um, he just thought, so much about how geology um, was interesting and that this view would change geologic thought forever. So as he looked at the walls of the Grand Canyon, um, his ideas that the rocks were cut down by the Colorado River was really solidified in his mind because he was like, oh, look here, you have to get this cut by this. Um, and this was a new idea. Um, that this one little river could cut these rocks. That was kind of a big idea. Um, prior to this time when people thought about the landscape, um, everything thought that the land that we see out today was created by catastrophic biblical events. Um, so most notably this would be things being described by the biblical flood flood excuse me the image that we're looking at right here is archbishop usher and he was alive um, from 1581 to 1656 and what he did is he went through the bible and he counted back generations like whom begat whom and he used those dates to determine the absolute age of the earth so the time at which god created the earth and he calculated it down to 4004 bc um so at the time when they looked at places like the Grand Canyon, it was thought that it was during the biblical flood that this whole big canyon was formed. It wasn't formed just by the slow processes that we see happening. Okay, um, and that was kind of how people thought. Um, and then later, um, as naturalists and geologists began to explore the landscape and starting to make observations, seeing fossils really high up in places on top of mountains and whatnot, they started to realize that that really wasn't well explained by a biblical flood. And so the person we're looking at here is James Hutton. Um, he's considered to be the father of modern geology. He was alive from 1726 to 1797. Um, and his idea was that when we look at the landscape, there are processes happening today that seem very, very small, but over long periods of geologic time, they can make a larger impact on places on the earth and they can shape it to look like we see today. So the idea of uniformitarianism is just that the processes we see happening today created the landscape that we know about. Um, so this actually supports the idea of an old earth um, because with time we can actually see these changes. Um, now what's very interesting is when we think about the world today, we actually do know that the land is shaped by these processes that are happening today, but we do see more catastrophic events. So we do get flooding events that start to leave deposits. Um, we we do see records where there have been meteorite impacts, okay, so those are still catastrophic events, but it's um, important to realize that uniformitarianism describes these everyday changes, and then there are bigger events that can leave behind more impactful um, deposits, and we see that in the rock record. Okay, when we go and we try to decipher the Earth's past, we use two basic techniques, relative age dating and absolute age dating, and today we're going to focus on relative age dating. This tells us the sequence in which events happened. It does not give us a specific age date. Um, there are three basic laws that were um, figured out by Niklas Steno in Western Italy in the mid-1600s, and that's the law of superposition, original horizontality, and then cross-cutting relationships. And then we'll talk about the other laws that are listed here at the end of this presentation. 
The law of superposition just tells us that when we look at a sequence of rocks that have not been overturned, the rocks that are on the bottom are going to be older than the rocks that are on the top. So this is again another look at the Grand Canyon. We can see that the Supai group down here is sitting below the Hermit Shale. Okay, so Supai group is older than the shale, um, which is older than the Coconino sandstone, the Torweep, and then the Kaibab limestone is the youngest. Okay, um, and then this has gone out and been confirmed when we start to look at the ages of fossils within them. Okay, the principle of original horizontality says that um, sedimentary rocks, when they are deposited in a basin, they are deposited horizontally. So if they haven't been disturbed, we'll see nice horizontal layers. So we can see that again right here in the Grand Canyon, nice flat layers. So this hasn't been turned over. When we see sedimentary rocks that have been folded, we know that something's happened. So in this case, these layers started out horizontally, then they underwent some compression that kind of folded those layers layers up to create, I'm trying to make folds with my fingers, <laughs> crumpled that up so we went from here to crumple to make those layers, okay, so the crumpling happened afterwards. Okay, the next principle is the principle of cross-cutting relationship, and this tells us that when we see something cutting through layers, we know that the event of cutting happened after those rocks were present. So when this image, we're actually looking at some sedimentary rocks that have been overturned and then faulted. We know they're overturned because they're no longer horizontal. There's a little person here, and then there's this large fault cutting through them. So because the fault cuts through these rock layers, we know that that fault is younger than the rocks that they cut, okay? Um, we can also look at it with igneous rocks. So this dark igneous rock is cutting through this lighter colored igneous rocks. So what happened is when we see an igneous rock cutting through one, we know that that igneous rock cut through the older rocks as it was crystallizing. So this black rock is younger than this pink rock, okay? We can use these three basic um, tools to decipher big, huge blocks of rock. So we could spend time and look through here and figure out using cross-cutting relationships, using um, that original horizontality, we can actually walk backwards and figure out which event was happened before or after the others. Okay. Other tools that we like to use are things like inclusions. An inclusion is when we find one piece of a rock within another. So we see this nice black rock within this lighter colored granite. Okay, so this inclusion is older than the granite because it's inside of it. So how does that work? Well, to make an inclusion, we're going to have some um, bedrock and as that rock is sitting there this intrusive magma came up and it started to cut through and it actually captured pieces of the surrounding rock and we see those right here so those are inclusions when we see this we know that these inclusions are older than this igneous rock Okay, we can take this further. If we start to weather down this area, we've taken off the top, we've actually broken up on the rocks on the surface, which has created some new inclusions or class, okay? And so then those class can be included in the sedimentary rock that's then deposited over the top of it. Now, if we were to walk out, even if this had been turned over, we could still use these inclusions to figure out the order of these events so that this bedrock would be the oldest and then we'd have the igneous rock would be the next layer and then this sedimentary rock would come next. Okay, now we do see the word nonconformity here. That's our next tool that we're going to look at, which is an unconformity. These are intervals of time that are not represented by rocks when we go out into the area. Um, so there are three types of unconformities that we look at, and they're shown here in red. So these are places where we're seeing a gap or a break in the rocks that are there. So we have angular unconformities, we have disconformities, and then we have nonconformities. An angular con unconformity is where we see a boundary that has angled or tilted sediments, sedimentary layers below, and horizontal layers above. So if you were to stand here and kind of draw this, you can see there's a nice horizontal line that kind of comes through right about here, and it goes behind that little plateau, um, where we see these rocks are tilted down below, and then the rocks above are nice and horizontal. So that's an angular unconformity. So we had some rocks that were horizontal. We'll kind of go through this. Then they were folded, which is what we see down below. Then we started to weather off the top, so that created those tilted layers. 
and then that kind of cuts that down so if we could cut through my fingers and then we're going to start to deposit flat horizontal rocks on top of those okay a disconformity is where we find sedimentary rocks that are parallel above and below the boundary so we can see one disconformity right here and we can also see one disconformity right here so above and below that boundary the rocks are still horizontal now what's happening here is where we've had a period of either non-deposition or we've had a change in the type of the sediment that's being deposited so we're going from coarser to finer maybe from sandstone to limestone or it's just a break where we can see that there had to be something maybe we were depositing the rocks then the the sea level retreated maybe we weathered some stuff down and then sea level came back up and we deposited more rocks on top but that boundary in between them still horizontal is called a disconformity a nonconformity is where we have sedimentary rocks overlying crystalline rocks so we have some um, kind of granites down below with um, nice flat horizontal sedimentary rocks above and on this side we have some metamorphic rocks with um, more or less um, horizontal sedimentary rocks above. So it's just the boundary between sedimentary rocks and either metamorphic or igneous rocks. So if you wanted to look at this picture, you want to take a guess, try to figure out what unconformity do you see here. And the big hint is to always step back and draw the picture first. Okay, um, hopefully you're seeing that you have some angled sediments down below and horizontal sediments above. So this is an angular unconformity. All right, now fossils are used also um, in trying to figure out the relative age dating um, of events that happen in the geologic record. Um, so fossils take on many types. We can see the hard parts. They get replaced by different minerals. We see molds and casts, impressions, carbon films, and even trace fossils, which could be footprints or burrows. Um, what's really important when we're looking at rock units is when we find index fossils. These are fossils that have a short geologic time span, so they only occurred for a pretty short period in Earth's history, but they were found over a very large geographic area. So we find them in lots of places, but because they only live during one little period, whenever we find them in those rocks, we know that those rocks had to have been deposited during that short time period. It helps us figure that timing out. Now we do like to correlate when we start to see fossils. Um, what we're actually looking at here are some rock layers that have different groups of fossils in them. If we looked at rock unit B here on the left um, and we see that it has a trilobite, a brachiopod, a sea star, we have some plant fossils and even a bivalve. When we go and we are looking at over here, this is actually showing the geologic range when that fossil is found. So this bivalve was found over a long period, trilobite over a shorter period. To deposit this rock and get all of these fossils, it could only happen at a time period when all of those organisms were alive. So that's what we're showing here. So this rock can't be any older than this time period because we wouldn't see the trilobite, but it can't be, or excuse me, any younger, and it can't be any older than the time period where we first start to see that plant fossil. So we can actually get a boundary, a rough estimate, say, okay, it was during this time period um, that that was forming. And the same at unit A. So we're actually looking where all of them overlap, and the age determinant for these two would be this T-Rex fossil and the maple leaf. Okay, so it can't be any older than the maple leaf and it can't be any younger than when the T-Rex was alive. So again, we can get that general sequence. Now correlation is the last thing we'll talk about and this is where we're matching rocks in one place to rocks in different places. Um, we can do this because in some places these rocks, again, they have huge horizontal extent um, and um, they match up with other places. So the classic example when we talk about correlation is looking at um, the Grand Canyon. We can look at Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon National Park beautiful places to visit. Um, but what we find in the Grand Canyon are the oldest rocks, and as we go up sequence, these rocks get younger. At the top, we see the Kaibab limestone, which if we then drive all the way up to Bryce, or excuse me, Zion Canyon, and the Kaibab limestone makes up the rocks at the very bottom of that canyon. So then the rocks on top of it are younger. At the top, we see the Navajo sandstone. 
But then, you know, in this area, we wouldn't know anything else about the history unless we drive all the way over to Bryce Canyon, and that's where we find the Navajo sandstone at the bottom. We can use all three of these places to really build a beautiful time period of the whole area and understand the geologic area of a much larger extent because of correlation. Uh, that's a quick introduction to relative age dating. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to your questions.